academics. Today we have with us Dr. Srimati Basu, who is a professor of gender and women's studies and anthropology at the University of Kentucky. She is the president-elect of the Association of Feminist Anthropology. Her research tracks the legacies of feminist reforms. In the monographs, she comes to take her rights, Indian Women, Property and Propriety, published in 1999, uh, and The Trouble with Marriage, Feminists Confront Law and Violence in India, University of California Press published it in 2015, and the anthology Dowry and Inheritance in the series Issues in Indian Feminism, published by Kali for Women in 2005. The anthology Conjugality Unbound, Sexual Economy, State Regulation and Marital Form in India, again published by Women Unlimited in 2015, which was co-edited with Lucinda Ramberg, continues the exploration of marriage and conjugality. At present, she is writing a monograph on anti-feminist men's rights groups, following a 2013-14 uh, to 14 Fulbright Fellowship to conduct fieldwork with MRAs across Indian cities. A very welcome, uh, warm welcome to you, ma'am, on our platform. Very glad to have you with us today. So uh, just to sort of start off the conversation, um, thank you, Dipal. we'd like to know, right. uh, we'd like to know how did thank the institution- Thank you. I just want to say one thing. I should update my web page more often because I have now time has passed. Now I am the actual president of the Feminist Anthropology Association. But maybe we'll talk about some of that, some of the kind of new work of what it means, right, to do um, feminist work in anthrosocial centers. Thank you. Right, right. And okay. thank you to Nita Parna for inviting me and all the all the work it's taken for us to set this up across time zones. <laughs> so go on. Right. So just to begin the conversation, uh, how did the institution of family courts in India come into being? So, um, you know, it's interesting that um, what the, I mean, family courts don't just emerge in India, right? They emerge kind of globally at the same time out of a concern according, I mean, if you track it, you can see that, um, uh, in um, so just to remind your students who my students certainly don't remember 1975 so I like to just uh, bring up this point since 1975 to 1985 right was the UN decade for women uh, we know that all around the world there was a lot of concern for institutions how you know access to justice was a big part of the UN decade for women's organizing right um, and um the Indian group super usefully, right? The, the document that is produced in India is still stands as um, one of the most important kind of statements and compendia of women's rights, right? So globally, at the global level, you know, if you look at those documents, including CEDAW, um, there is a focus on access to justice. And in the Indian women's movement, um, <laughs> there was also this concern of, you know, this constantly like um, going to law as a scary, distant entity, you know, not um, uh, not being able to have your say. Indeed, you know, much of the much of the Indian work came together with horrible experiences that people had in uh, in courts. Right. So so family courts came about with the idea of um, simplifying that procedure, right, having direct access. Uh, to that. So uh, the other thing I should say, um, oh, and by the way, uh, <laughs> the same, um, um, so in India, right, uh, this document also involved, um, why am I blanking on the name of the document? I was going to look, you all remember what it is, right? One second. It is, we all know what it's called. Equality report, right, that we are so familiar with towards equality report of the Committee of the Status of Women. Um, so, you know, one of its, uh, it really has um, a really stark, uh, stark, uh, big condemnation of um, the patri very local family, as we call it, right, the male uh, the male head of household, male patrilineus, the, the joint family, the extended family, as the locus for uh, violence against women, right? And as the locus of um, um, <laughs> women not having much resources to go on. Uh, 
So, um, so that was on the one hand, right? That is one move that comes out of the women's movement that comes out of the demand to simplify things, including simplifying things in courts, right? So um, this kind of the idea of lawyerless courts that the family courts is, is one of that. I think it's important, very important to say that globally among lawyers and hence also in India, um, there is just a movement to simplify court procedures, right? To so to have set aside courts, right? So all these set aside courts that you see from Lok Adalat to consumer courts to uh, now, you know, courts for builders, all these are for because the, um, uh, I won't cite the numbers here, but you can see that the number of cases per head in India is like incredibly high. Courts are incredibly crowded, right? So there were all these mechanisms for, um, setting aside you know drawing off uh some of those some of the large number of cases by making specialized courts so um there are let me just say one more thing <laughs> going into a long uh i can go on about this forever right so curtail myself um so uh, in places like um japan for example right there is and and china has had a version of that there is a long tradition of um working in divorce through mediation. So some of those places adapted that into family court structures, right? Um, other places like famously Australia uh, have a kind of mandatory mediation for family court issues, but it's basically a legal structure. So um, India has slowly evolved to have uh, a little of each, right? Many places have adapted family court, other places don't have it. Um, they are sort of mediation based, um, but they are also basically lower level courts so that are you know part of all the processes of appeal and you know every legal structure is part of them. So um, um, yeah, <laughs> and we can talk a little bit. I, I don't want to keep talking. Uh, <laughs> but after you say something, we can talk maybe about the ideology that the courts uh, try to incorporate. Right. So just to, uh, you know, further the discussion a little bit, uh, you do look at everyday adjudication in the context of the family mm -hmm. courts. So uh, how does it become a site of ethnographic interest? And, you know, what do these adjudications mean? So um, I don't know if you all have done it, but you should go and just take your students some time to a court. Uh, it is a it is a lot of uh you know it's very illuminating to see um as you call it you know everyday adjudication as a um as a way in which law is formed and as a way in which people also uh, negotiate you know in in um, ways that are helpful to them and sometimes very unhelpful to them so um so i you know i've done this in um, undergraduate classes i encourage my phd students sometimes to go and see um so one of the things you can see in courtrooms that i was so interested in is that um we always, you know, for my for my dissertation work on property that we were talking about earlier, I basically studied um, judgments, right? I studied appellate judgments. Uh, but I mean, the short version of that is that I quickly figured out that there are very few, very few people go to court over women claiming property because women basically opt out, right? So <laughs> there were not that many. If I went to court, I was not going to get much to study on that topic, right? So I didn't. So there is no dearth of cases on divorce, right, that I could find in the courts. Uh, and then you can see something very different, right? When you read a judgment, uh, which has a summary of events, you have a kind of a bare summary of events, right? Now, I've spent a lot of my time um, reading those judgments, and you can get, I'm not going to say you don't get a sense of people's personalities and claims in that, right? But when you actually, when you are in the court, you see interactions between people, right? Um, you see kind of how the personality of the um, people involved in litigation invo you know affects the judge affects the people concerned you know how uh, family courts have all these court counselors so how um, the family court counselors respond to them that first of all that right second um, people say a lot um that is not exactly legal, but 
that sets them up as certain kinds of beings, right? So Sally Mary, for example, um, has some very nice uh, observations of quotes showing that sometimes uh, people can um, even make an argument that uh, can can make as let's say an appealing affective argument that works in their favor in a way that um, that's an extra to law, right? But other people, I I I often teach uh, from this other kind of cross cultural material um, that um, uh, so there's an article on this woman who's supposed to go to court and just say something minimal, right? But she feels herself to be a subject who. Um, isn't given because of her race and class, isn't given a sort of uh, the full dignity or, or the court's attention, right? So she says something that's not actually according to script that actually makes things more difficult for her, right? But people are constantly negotiating their, you know, very, uh, Judith Butler says, sort of has some version of saying, right, that we all always kind of act in, um, in, little bit in imitation and a little bit in resistance to the discourses around us. So you can totally see that in court, right? The other thing you can see is all that uh, in, um, you know, the work of silence, which you cannot read in appellate judgment, right? Um, the work of visible emotion, right? But, but I should say, since you asked this question, right? That is also, uh, you know, methodologically, difficult to track down in the way judgments are tracked down, right? How much is in my eyes? How much am I missing? So um, uh, lots of people who have worked on court ethnographies, Pratiksha Bakshi for one, um, <laughs> for having done a bunch of this work. Uh, Sonal Makija some years ago worked in the Bombay. Um, she worked in the uh, PWDVA courts. Um, so just, just just to take those two examples, right, in the courtroom, that every time someone does a legal ethnography, you can see that we spend a lot of time agonizing about all the things we miss, all the things we can't hear, right? So that's also that's also important to take into account. Right. And of course, you have conducted extensive ethnographic work in Kolkata's family courts, and uh, as an ethnographer and from your own research experience, uh, would you say that alternate dispute resolution mechanisms would be able to provide more satisfactory outcomes for marginalized subjects? I think, uh, so there are two sets of very clear, I, I, I should answer your question by saying I feel um, uh, quite iffy about it. But I also feel uh, that it provides a space for people to negotiate. And what we are wanting is different options and different spaces to negotiate, right? So there are two kind of um, um, different paths on this. One is, um, so this is sort of a, some of this work comes out of, uh, legal studies scholars who are interested in game theory, for example, right? That um, this bargaining in the shadow of law, the, so going outside of law, because law is so expensive, law is so timely, law is so rule bound, right? That stepping outside of law gives you a way to make a solution that's tailored to you, right? So, um, so you know, um, a. Sunita and Vasudha Nagraj some years ago uh, did a piece on marriage negotiations in India where they make that argument, right, that as lawyers, it's good to have all of those other kinds of venues that people can negotiate because, you know, you can, you can, it's very easy to see that um, <laughs> uh, legal venues just provide uh, often uh, provide unsatisfactory means, right? But we know um, that uh, Alternate dispute resolution methods, right, are not at all free of power, right? The mediator believes that, I mean, I think I have seen um, lots of mediators who feel very serious about their work, who really feel they want to be impartial. You know, I spent some time uh, in Delhi, in the uh, Delhi Mediation Center that's uh, attached to, um, it's close to the high courts, right? Uh, but 
the Samadharan uh, organization, right? And um, you can see that people are very sincerely engaged in the process of mediation, right? But mediation doesn't happen in a vacuum, right? You are bringing, this is family law, very often involving family violence. You are bringing people into a space in which there are already power dynamics, right? There is already hurt. There is already like, you know, uh, every drama that you have ever watched on TV is already enacted in many of these venues, right? So it's it's hard to come to a neutral space or it's hard to come to a space of leverage uh, that is advantageous. So that's one thing. So folks like Laura Nader, for example, uh, make an argument of alternate dispute resolution then as a medium of power, right? So, um, some years ago, it's been several years now, you know, Erin uh, Moore made this film on a woman in, in Rajasthan who kind of uh, tries to work her ways through, it's, it's a book and a film uh, on alternate dispute resolution venues. And that reminds you, like, where are you going to, right? Uh, I mean, why do we think that a panchayat, for example, is going to be more sympathetic, right? Or... Um, uh, as you know from my book, you know, I identify various different levels of alternate dispute resolution. So in Kolkata, when I worked, it was very common that at that time it was the left front government. I'm sure Trinamul has its own people. Um, there are all sorts of, uh, you know, para based um, <laughs> kind of mediation venues. There is that, right? There is your actual circle of relatives. There are official mediation organizations, West Bengal government has some mediation venues, right? There are lots of old organizations, um, uh, feminist organizations, I mean, uh, who do their own forms of counseling. All of them are constrained by certain kinds of things. You know, they are working in this, they are working within, let's say, the conditions where um, the... Um, you know, like, as you know, I discussed some cases where a person comes in, right, to a very feminist organization. They ask her, what do you want? She says, well, where else would I live? I think I should go back home, right? Or I have these kind of, uh, that sounds horrible stories of in the courts, someone comes in, I mean, the someone tells me a story that, um, you know, we had an excellent resolution to this case because, you know, even after the woman was hit with an, with, an axe in the head, I sent her back to her house. And you're like, oh, you know, what kind of resolution is that, right? So the power of places and communities or the power of women to uh, not be, uh, to really not have that many realistic options, you know, money-wise and housing-wise also shapes alternate dispute resolutions, right? So for all those ways, it is a very kind of uh, iffy solution for women, first of all, right? Additionally, you know, all these levels are good. You can approach, maybe something happens at the para, maybe something happens at the political organization, maybe the, or this, you know, the DDs at the NGO work out something for you. But um, then you might very well be advised to go to the thana or some level of thana, including uh, the violence against women cells, you might be advised to go to the court. Now, the timing of all of that and the legal mechanisms of all of that don't always tie up, right? So people get caught in all sorts of timing issues in, in have they launched this case too fast and does that close up that case is also like, you know, puts puts uh, people in really kind of difficult positions that they might not get what they want, right? This is not to say that some people don't. But finally, the thing that I want to say is that um, what is seen as an advantage is that given the sort of laws, um, given the combination of laws in India, right, that, um, um, you know, <laughs> contrary to popular perception, uh, divorce law essentially uh, puts women in a kind of a, you know, objects of charity, objects of alimony, right? It's a highly gendered discourse. So, you don't think of um, women as having having built up um, the marriage fund, right? Women as having contributed with their labor to the marriage and to be entitled to, let's say, half the profits of what they own. Also very much complicated by the ways in which people rely on uh, joint property for their main fund in India. So um, 
so divorce settlements tend to be like kind of alimony based, even when you hear of very large numbers, right? They're often in the context of a person who makes, has a lot more money than that. But uh, so, so one of the ways that's um, seen to be more advantageous then is to have a simultaneous criminal case going, right? That uh, may lend some leveraging room and may lend some negotiating room um, to the divorce claims. Now that obviously has its advantages, right? But it also has its disadvantages in the timing may be wrong, the launching may be wrong. You know, um, as you know, um, I look at lots of cases where judges are really irritated when they're hearing a, a divorce case, which also has a 498 case there somewhere, right? Um, so, I mean, <laughs> It's good that ADR exists as an option, right? That the only way people move forward is not through, uh, not through divorce law. But it's also wise for us to remember all the pitfalls that all of these do, including creating legal pitfalls, right? And not just pitfalls outside law. Right. Uh, so now sort of to, uh, you know, ask you about something which is again very critical to uh, marriage lit litigations which is uh, the question of sexuality what role does sexuality play in marriage litigations and uh, if you could you know tell us a little bit more uh, with reference to your field work in kolkata uh, and dhaka T tell me more about what you mean by sexuality i mean uh, i know I, I saw uh, i saw that was on a list i mean do we mean um, questions of adultery? Do we mean questions of are you a straight person? Do you want like... Is that yes. what you mean? I mean, yes, uh, because you do talk about adultery and maybe even, you know, homosexuality and how sexuality gets represented with the body itself. Yeah, so I think, you know, it is it is interesting to track down these questions of sexuality and sexual orientation, right? I didn't see a whole lot on that. So I'll just, I mean, that is a whole other thing to think about. Um, but I think, I think you're referring to the work where we see, you know, that the body embodiment, to say, use that word, right, always hovers on uh, around court in certain kinds of ways, right? Who did what, how how that body matters. So um, I'll maybe say a little bit more about one of the cases uh, that I described there, uh, which is that it's, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, sometimes when I'm reading appellate case law, you'll see how judges go on for page after page describing uh, sexual and bodily acts as a way to determining things, right? But we know that sexuality is not right, like in the realm of law. So this happened. So this has to do with. Um, let me back up. So, um, because family law is still, unless you have a mutual consent divorce, right, there is no um, something like irretrievable breakdown. Uh, didn't hasn't passed right so or some judges have given some version of this but it hasn't passed as a regular thing so uh so fault-based divorce continues to dominate right so you are going to go through um for whatever religion you occupy um you're going to have to come up within a realm of things right? so uh between these things cruelty neglect adultery um are some of the main ones, right? So um, here, um, so bringing a charge of adultery is a common and useful way to take a divorce case forward, right? Um, and often, you know, um, like they involve allegations and sometimes I'm sure real events with the, I mean, uh, 
you know, recently I've been talking to private detectives for uh, my own new project. So I see that sometimes, you know, sometimes there may be evidence, but in court you don't, you're not really investigating adultery. I have not seen anyone investigating adultery claims in any great detail, right? People are just sort of putting that forward as a reason to move the divorce forward. Now, cruelty is an interesting thing here, right? Because there are various, various ways in which um, cruelty can be alleged. So uh, Amrita Dhanda has a, a, a list that I often cite because I find it so funny. It's like a list of all these things that people cited in cases from um, she didn't smile at the bogat, she didn't, she made parathas instead of chapatis, like she's not duly attentive, she's not duly, you know, so all of that can be cited as cruelty. Certainly um, the failure to have, so go back to sexuality, right? Uh, the People have, you know, some number of people, Shaktoshi Bondol has looked at these cases, um, some number of uh, women have uh, cited the husband's failure to have sex as often as they want, as um, in their cases, right? Some number, of, certainly I have seen some number of women have um, filed 377, the famous 377 uh, cases around sexual behavior, right? But very often that's also in the, that's a criminal case filed in conjunction with the um, sort of divorce act. But um, I'll go back briefly to the case that you're thinking about. So there is someone alleges, right, that um, um, so-and-so is incapable of sex. Right. Uh, and here you can look at the case law to see that judges are really very entertaining and thinking about this because they want to decide, right? Like, is the, um, you know, sexuality is decided, uh, let's say, on the basis of um, the erectness of the penis, right? As opposed to, we all know human sexuality is not, you know, obviously confined to, you know, penetrative heterosex. Um, but if if uh, sexual satisfaction is a criterion of um, uh, cruelty or not, then you know the judges find themselves discussing different parts of the body in brief than are um, than we might consider to be the ways in which uh, sexuality is judged, right? So uh, and also I think in that case you're in the case that you are maybe thinking of someone alleges. Uh, the man alleges the woman of having been pregnant before based on what we don't know, right? Based on how he thinks her breast should look, etc. So judges get caught up in this normative evaluation of what should count as sex, what should count as proper sex, etc. So um, in Dhaka, the thing you were thinking of, same kind of thing, right? Dhaka had at that time even more of, a, uh, of uh, an emphasis on... Um, uh, mediation as a way to, you know, again, avoid time, expense, move on. And um, so the the case that I was talking about is a woman who made, you know, you, you could tell that there was something um, that really wounded her about the marriage, that really wounded her in an embodied way, right? That she was, uh, maybe it was marital rape, maybe it was some other additional kind of um, physical cruelty, um, and that no man, you know, one can never tell, right, if anything is just a negotiation or not, but you can also tell that people want court to be a place where they can have their say. They don't just want, you know, the negotiation to go away in silence. Um, and so, um, so in that way, she wants her body to be brought back into the center of discourse, right? That the violated body should be something that the world hears about, right? So to just make it go away because of time and expense isn't a thing. And um, I mean, we can, I, I've uh, just been teaching and I teach a class called gender power, gender power violence. Uh, it's comma, it is like depressing things from day one to <laughs> last day, alas. So we are... Um, doing doing a unit on human rights law now right so um I, I mean i've been talking about that right that even in um if you're looking at these transitional justice processes right after after regimes let's say which have had 
wartime rape as a as just a technique of war right but even in in those cases too one of the difficulties that people see is going to court to be re-traumatized in talking about rape is just a very difficult thing that we add to you all know from reading the Pratiksha Bhakshi's work um, in addition to other things, right? A court is totally like a re-traumatization of rape. But, um, but on the other hand, people want their stories to be known and told, you know? Uh, so that's, wh that's where the, the body becomes, you know, in the earlier cases that I described in the Kolkata case versus the Dhaka case, for example, the body becomes both a site in which um, ideas of sexuality are formed, the idea of what constitutes, what should constitute heterosex, you know, what's the space between um, having sex, sexual pleasure and reproduction gets constituted in that moment, but also sexual violence, you know, figures in all of these things and how that should be talked about in the sphere of divorce is also something you see in the quotes. Right. Uh, and then sort of to, you know, shift from there and talk about uh, uh, when we have to talk about family law, uh, how do women, Muslim women face and confront the family law? And uh, from your work in Kolkata, is it possible to argue that their confrontation uh, with law is different from that of Hindu women? So, uh, you know, I am I am really not that suitable a person to talk about this just because, you know, I studied whatever courts cases came to the court, right? Um, I didn't make a sort of particular archive of studying um, how Muslim women come to court in uh, ways that other people have done, right? So Sylvia Vatuk, actually a very senior anthropologist has, you know, for now 50 years followed Muslim women's cases in court. And you can see that, um, so I, I'm just gonna talk about the few cases that came to my court. And also, you know, as you well know, um, this depends on um, the nature of the state they confront, the nature of the judges they confront, right? So. Um, um, you know, when this, when uh, the whole triple talaq thing came up again, like three, four years ago, I thought, what? Like in, I think, I remember that this, in 2001, there was a lower level court, right? Uh, that decided, that sort of had a pronouncement on triple talaq that went around, right? And that was done with no, I mean, in the same ways that um, it shouldn't happen. Um, but it was by a very kind of, very, a judge who um, spouted some very obvious Hindutva level discourse, right? So, so there is that sort of court. I think in the courts I worked in, I would say they were always Hindu judges. You know that partly that is a structure of the um, employment system of the judicial service. We know, right, that from Bengal there have been um, very eminent jurists who have been Muslim, but they did not work their way through the. Uh, they were not there in that family court um, setting. So, um, and I would describe them as, you know, um, Hindu majoritarian in a way that, you know, they passed on certain normative ideologies, but they were not, you know, they were not opposed to giving Muslim women a, a hearing on their terms, right? They sort of, there was a, somewhat of a process of othering, but not necessarily a process of any kind of um, overt stereotyping or discrimination or anything. But um, the, you know, the crux of the matter was, of course, Muslim women come to court on different terms than Hindu women, right? Because divorce and alimony is basically on different terms. So, uh, so there is this kind of, uh, you know, way of saying to women sometimes that, well, you know, uh, once you're divorced, it's over, right? Uh, certainly at that time, there was a kind of prevailing, uh, I mean, I worked on my family, so for a long time, right? So um, 
many of the judgments like that Daniel Latifi judgment came out in the middle of that, right? So um, all, the whole landscape changed, but there was this way of saying, right? That, oh, you had better behave because once you divorce, it's over, right? Now we know that there are other ways of, you know, counting, maybe a settlement can be counted in different ways that uh, maybe those cases can be seen differently. So there is this uh, very odd way in which, uh, you know, um, Hindu judges uh, might um, uh, grant Muslim women certain more things because they are trying to um, curtail the power of Muslim men from their position, right? But again, I didn't have enough cases to do it. I'm telling you this based on other cases that I see. Um, but uh, one of the other things, you know, that uh, uh, Zoya Hassan and Ritu Menon have like now, now um, at least a decade old study of law, larger study of Muslim women, right? Where it was a more, uh, um, a much bigger sample. So one of the things when you ask that question is to also think of how um, religion in India tracks um, class, tracks of course tracks caste as well. So um, even in my very little sample, right? Many of the cases I saw were very poor women. So um, there you see that judges have to behave in a, a, another particular kind of way, right? And not, um, not particularly um, sympathetic to the structural problems way, I would say. So that's the other thing that comes into play. Right. So could you also talk a little bit about uh, your experience of doing field work in the legal context? Uh, what would be some of the uh, challenges that an ethnographer can face in a courtroom? Well, um, I mean, I highly recommend it. So I think you can learn, a, even if you're studying, studying something else. Um, I think watching how they play out in people's lives, it teaches you a lot about culture and not just about law, right? Um, you know, uh, to, teaches you how people perform discourses of kinship, discourses of intimacy, right? All of these things. Um, but the challenges are, of course, to get into those venues, you know, to understand them, to hear them. So I told you I'm teaching uh, my uh, uh, postgraduate seminar on uh, graduate on qualitative methods right now. And so um, we've been talking a lot about multisensory things, right? So what does it mean to do multisensory research? And I think the courtroom is a perfect example. It is oversaturated with, you know, sights, sounds, smells, <laughs> et cetera, right? Uh, but it is also like cacophonous in that way, right? There is too much going on. So you will you miss half the things that you see, right? So you have to be uh, prepared for that, right? You have to be prepared to observe too many things all at the same time. Um, and, um, you know, there's also sort of um, institutional and logistical obstacles, right? So um, it's unclear what data people can share, right? Um, it's unclear which officials will, let, even in a public venue, right? It's unclear who will let you in to do what. So you can't just kind of uh, predict what um, role it's going to take. But I, I want as i started out by saying i want to make a plug for for trying it in a so suppose you you know suppose you just studied judgments right or suppose you interviewed the people who go to court if you could find your way to having i didn't do that right i worked i wanted to study what the judges did what the counselors did etc i didn't unless incidentally you know unless incidentally people spoke to me my object was not to interview the people going through it but uh I mean, you learn something different from being in that space and watching the institution and watching how the state operates than you do from just talking to people or just seeing appellate judgments, right? But you also have to do it with the knowledge of um, all the limitations that uh, that may have as a, so you know, put it together with other things, I say. Right. 
a very different question actually uh, at the beginning uh, you mentioned that you are now actually the president of the association for feminist anthropology yeah. so could you also talk a little bit about the kind of work that you do and you know uh, what our young uh, maybe listeners as well as readers can take away in anthropology right yeah so yeah i think we i don't know i feel like we are at a very um interesting and uh, our things are happening to us for fortunate and unfortunate reasons in the study of gender so i was actually thinking about that with the association and the, the main panels we sponsored etc right so one um certain things that um are in public conversation that we can um have a lot to say in one uh, you can think about me too or whatever it's called in different parts of the world right so the fact that we are talking about gender based violence as a um, you know as a real phenomenon in the world how law doesn't capture it how people might see it differently and for our field in anthropology in general and i think feminist anthropology has a lot to say about that um how it affects i mean this affects you you folks and those of you who are training sociologists right how it affects people going out into the field you know who holds a lot of power to decide um you know who will get what job are you how are you preventing women for example by constructing a discourse of you won't be safe there you can't do that right but on the other hand how also are you listening to women who might um come back from field work with various kinds of experiences that you know that you need to listen and work through so uh, so one of the things we did at this conference was talk about this panel was called risks and harms of field field work and field workers right where we're looking at forms of power in institutions but maybe also forms of uh, power that one negotiates while doing field work so second um I think one of the things we are talking about it's very common in my students here and I know it's very common among folks in India from those I talk to is that we see gender itself as much more destabilized right that we want to talk about um, forms of gendered embodiment about you know um, let's say trans and gender non-binary interventions in thinking about gender as different than sex and gender as different than talking about sexual orientation so anthropology has of course um a long uh, history of d doing that, right? Um, I mean, we are very comfortable with this idea that, um, you know, there are hundreds of forms of gender and that there are many, many variations of sex. So that's a very interesting intervention to have for, for students to think about. And um, uh, so, so in the US um, and in India, really, to take two different parts of it, we want to talk about. So we see, um, I think uh, people were asking us, like, what is, what are some of the uh, core uh, principles of feminist anthropology? To me, a core principle of feminist anthropology is intersectionality, right? Is to look at gender not by itself, you know, uh, but as being formed through uh, through caste and class, and you know region and ethnicity, et cetera. So I think at, in India, you can see there's now a really robust scholarship on how to think about caste. And similarly, um, in the US, there is a very, um, I, I think, um, good, healthy attempt uh, to look at you know race, not just as a category um, that constitutes things in those ways, but to study other phenomena, right? Like to study uh, reproduction, for example, through race, or to study labor um, through how race and class also constitutes itself. So that's another thing. Um, and finally, I would say that to me, it's very important in um, kind of feminist work in sociology and anthropology, is that we foreground voice and reflexivity, right? Is that we look at power and position in the field. So that's another of the things that we are sort of putting forward in there. Well, thank you so much for that engaging conversation. And I'm sure that our listeners will take away a lot and perhaps also a much more renewed interest in law and, you know, doing ethnography in that field. So thank you once again, Professor Bas. You're 
You're most welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Vipali. And thank you, Ritaparna, for inviting me. And let's continue our conversation sometime. <laughs>